I'm always confused about how many R's there are. I'm not confused about the fact that this should be a Z. And this one also. Okay. So this is a kind of realizability that I already spoke about, but this is going to be an updated version, uh, which uh, James and I used to construct the topos of countable reals. And I would just like to, today I'd just like to focus on the realizability itself, okay? Um, okay, so to start with, let's just quickly um, recall the definition of partial combinatorial algebra. So this is a definition that was originally given by Saul Pepperman, and it's a general notion of what a model of computation can be. It's very, uh, it's very general. So there are all sorts of PCAs uh, made out of various models of computation, but also stranger ones, which are topological in nature or even set theoretic in nature. So what is a PCA? Is this font big enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the definition goes like this: a PCA is given. is given by a carrier set A. Maybe I will not try to typeset everything in LaTeX, okay? And an application operation, this is called application, which we write as a dot. And um, well, let's use Agla notation. It takes two elements of A and returns an element of A, and it's partial. So it may be undefined. Such that there exist special elements called K and S. They did not be unique. There could be many. Um, satisfying some conditions. And so the conditions are, um, so here, maybe right, for all x, y, z, and a. So first of all, k applied to x is always defined. So this means defined. In principle, when you apply, you may get an undefined result. Think about running a Turing machine on some on some tape, and it never it never terminates, and so the result is not defined. And k x y. By the way, this it, the operation is uh, left associative, so the way you read this is like this. This is always equal to x. So k of x is the constant always returns x, no matter what else you give it. And the second one is that s, x, y is defined, and s, x, y, z. So eventually, you stop writing the dot. You get rid of the, you, you, the dot becomes annoying, so we're, on, we're not going to write it. This is cleanly equal. I'll explain what that means to s, oops, no. X, Z, Y, Z. So this is clean equality. And A equals B means that we have some expressions. We're comparing two expressions. And some of either one, one or both could be undefined. And so this means if one is defined, then so is the other, and they are equal. So I allow the possibility that, they, that, some, that this is undefined, but if one side is undefined, then so must be the other. And if I write just equality here, this implies that A is defined and B is defined. So if I write this, this also contains the claim that both are defined. 
So that's what a PCA is. Also, we normally say that it needs to be non-trivial. That is to say, K must be different from S, okay? So for us, K is gonna be different from S. Otherwise, you can show that your PCA just has uh, one element. Okay, so why do we want this? This is, uh, in a sense, uh, a minimal or close to minimal setup that is needed to uh, explain the idea of realizability uh, and to be able to write down programs. This is enough to program. Uh, every, such, every such structure is, in fact, can encode any computable function from natural numbers to natural numbers. So it's quite powerful, okay? Uh, we'll see how that goes. So what's an example? So let's give two examples. One example is the unbiased lambda calculus. So I'm going to assume that you know what lambda calculus is. So how exactly do we do this? Our carrier set, we take closed lambda terms, modded out by beta equality. So this means closed lambda terms. Closed means no free variables. And this is equality with respect to beta reduction for lambda calculus. Um, so uh, what is application? Well, application is application. So formally speaking, I would need to write something like this. If I have a, an equivalence class represented by the term T, and so this is an equivalence class with respect to beta equality, applies to U with respect to beta equality is the equivalence class of PU. And now you have to write, now you have to prove an annoying dilemma that says that this is well defined, which becomes like substitution lemmas and things like that. You don't, we don't want to go there. It's well defined. And normally people just ignore this and they don't write, they don't write uh, equivalence classes um, because it's something like uh, So what is K? Now K is what you think it would be. So I'm, I'm, I will, or K is, I will stop writing equivalence classes. K is lambda x, y, x. And S is lambda x, y, z, x, z, y, z. So exactly what we want it to be. So that's an example of um, a combinatory algebra. This one, in fact, is total because application is always defined. In lambda calculus, you can apply anything to anything, and you just get another term. So it's, again, defined. So this one is total. So another example. is called Pliny's first algebra. Which I'll write as K1. So here, the underlying set is the natural set of natural numbers. And we think of them as codes. Um, to be a little more precise, usually I say we think of them as codes of Pliny, of, of Turing machines, but I think it's probably better to say that we think of these as codes of partial computable functions, of partial recursive functions. Um, I mean, either works, so there's no the real difference. Um, the, the reason for that is uh, when we define application, we use that. So how do we apply one number to another number? And now, of course, this is not multiplication. And by the way, traditionally, this application is act not actually written like this. It's often written like that because, I don't know, clearly liked strange notation. I don't know what the answer is to that. So this is notation for the nth part of a function. I would write it like this, phi and m, where phi is, is the partial recursive function coded by n. So there's going to be some standard coding of partial recursive functions. Um, that's the one you're supposed to use. And so decode n as source code of your program, run the program of the input m, see what happens, more or less. Now, to show that this is a PCA, we still need k and s. And that's a, piece, a little piece of programming that we're not going to go through. All you have to imagine is that you can actually write down some source code 
for a program or a Turing machine, you can construct a Turing machine. So let's think about it. What do we need to do for K? We need a Turing machine, which accepts a number, and then it needs to construct another Turing machine or the code of another Turing machine. So it gets a number X, then it needs to produce another number, and that number needs to encode a Turing machine, which will accept Y, throw it away, and output X. And you can imagine that this can be done programmatically. And something similar, but slightly more complicated for S. Uh, an important variant of this example is Kleene's first algebra relative to an oracle. So let's also say what that is. <clears throat> so if we have an oracle computation, which means that so if you remember, so partial recursive functions are the least class of functions that you can get from identity and projections. So you have n arguments, you project one of them, zero as a constant function, successor, and then you have primitive recursion and uh, minimization. Primitive recursion just means you can recursively call yourself on smaller on, on, on the predecessor, and minimization means you search for the first uh, uh, number in some, you have a function producing some numbers, and then you're searching for the k such that in the k place you see non zero. So that's that's an unbounded search. Uh, programmatically, this means you are allowed to write while loops that may never terminate. Okay. So that's so, so to get oracle computations, we throw in one more thing, which is we imagine that the Turing machine has access to a special tape on which some input is written. We call this tape the oracle, but don't think of it as magic. Think of it as output from the outer world. I think that's a better way to think of it. So there's some, some information flowing into the machine. Uh, it doesn't matter where it came from, but imagine it's written on a special input oracle tape. And so that's just a sequence of zeros and ones. So we define an oracle to be an element of the counter space, so the space of infinite space, space of infinite sequences of zeros and ones, and then we have phi of alpha of n. It's the nth. Now we say instead of saying partial recursive function, we say partial alpha recursive function. So this is these are functions which have this additional ability to read the to read the input from the outer world, from whatever alpha it was given. Um, <laughs> so that would be just an extra primitive instruction that you can run. So you can expect for any k, you get to expect, uh, expect alpha of k. So if you essentially calculate alpha of k, you calculate some k, then you look expect alpha of k. And now we get the cleanest algebra, k1 alpha, for this oracle alpha, which is still just the natural numbers, but we change, but we change applications so that we can use, for some reason, I'm not, I'm going in the wrong order here. We, we use the alpha as well. And once again, you can go through this KNS business, but there's one additional point that I would like to make. So if you think about how the how you're supposed to calculate what is k, k is the code of a certain machine. Let's think about it. Can you write, can you implement k in such a way that it ignores the oracle? So k, what k does is it, re it receives a number and it needs to calculate another number which encodes a machine that will ignore input and produce x. Does, or, does the oracle ever get involved in this computation? It never gets involved because given the number, you can just calculate the machine that's going to be your output without consulting the oracle. You don't need it. So there, this, is a, this is a point that will be important later. So we do have K and S, okay? They exist, but moreover, moreover, so these are now two numbers. Phi of K of alpha does not depend on alpha. And similarly for S. 
That is to say, if I change alpha, this is still the same function. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what alpha I have. And formally, this follows. You open the book on computability, and if they're careful enough, they when they speak about oracle computations, they have the UTM and the SMN theorems, and the UTM and uh, the recursion theorem as well is of this kind. They tell you that you can actually calculate the, the S in the SMN theorem, which is a different S, doesn't consult oracles. And, and similarly for K4, for, for the UTM, uh, one part, well, the relevant part of UTM, and also the recursion theorem. So things are, uh, as we would say, parametric in the oracle. Okay? You, the, things are computed uniformly in alpha, yes? Yeah. Like when you apply the application multiple times, do you do it for? Alpha or? Uh, here, yes, because I fixed an oracle. Oh, you fixed one. Yes, but this is going to change. Oh. When in parameterized divisibility, we'll have a whole set of oracles. Mm -hmm. So in principle, you could mix them. But right now, it's just always the same, it's just always the same oracle alpha. OK? Uh, so that's these are ordinary DCAs. So now let's look at what parameterized BCAs are. The idea is that we want to allow this alpha here to vary. Yes? But we would also like to have a general definition like this. So what needs to happen? Well, if you look at this, strictly speaking, this dot here, right? It's parameterized by alpha. It depends on the alpha as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to give an additional parameter to application called the parameter. OK? And in general, we're going to say it could be anything. It doesn't have to be oracles. We don't know what it is. It's just a set. So here's the definition. <laughs> a parameterized, I'm not going to write that, DPCA, parameterized PCA, is um, given by <laughs> Well, we have a carrier set A, we have a parameter set E, and we require this to be non-empty because otherwise it becomes it becomes more ridiculous than saying that K equals S. It's just you can't do anything. Um, uh, let me not make a mistake. Okay, there is a partial application operation. Uh, I don't know if I can do this. Dot, and then we'll write the parameter as a subscript here. And soon we will have better notation, so bear with me. For the moment, the notation is going to look ridiculous. So it's uh, which way do I want to write this? I'll write it like this P cross A cross A to A. So parameterize the P. It might make more sense to put the P between the two A's because I'll write it in the middle. Um, and such that something. So what is the something? There are K and S in A such that for all, and now we're going to involve parameter P and three elements X, X, Y, Z, and A. Uh, the conditions are as follows. Oh, I need two parameters in fact. P, Q. Okay. So the first condition. Uh, the first condition, I, I'll write it like this. There, there, is a, there, is a, there are conditions that correspond to this here, and then there are conditions that correspond to the equations. These are now going to change. They're not going to be anymore that just stuff is defined. We require a little more. So they are, if you apply K at P, you'll get the same thing as if you apply it and some other parameter q. This is precisely this business that in our motivating example, we may find a k 
such that it ignores the parameter. And this is saying, it, it, it's saying two things. It's saying it ignores the parameter. It doesn't depend. So let's be quite precise. It does not say that it will not inspect the parameter P. It says whichever parameter you give it, it's always giving you the same result. Maybe it is inspecting the parameter just for fun, right? And then doing something. Uh, it, because I wrote equal, this also means that k, kx at p is always defined because I wrote equal. This implies it's defined. So this is a stronger condition. We also automatically get that one. Okay, what do we want to write for s? So for s, we want to write spx is always equal to sqx, but also if you do it twice, it's equal that. And then we need equations, and the equations are if you apply, they are the expected equations. K, X, Y gives you X and S, and I'm going to write this out. And you can see that this, this is getting out of hand with all these indices. At least they are always the same. But this one is Z. So it's the same equation, it's just parameters. We're later going to give a name to these kinds of elements that don't depend on the parameter. We'll call them uniform, but not just for that. Yeah. Uh, so let's do something about this notation, because okay? we don't want to keep writing the same image. Most of the time, I think, in fact, always, except maybe in one or two cases, the P doesn't change. You never mix P and Q when, when you're working with these things, when you're working with the tripods and the reversibility, P is always the same. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take this P and put it out there. So let's be a little bit more precise about this. So if we have an expression, let me see what an expression is. An expression can be built like this. It could be one of some given variables. So suppose we allow some variables x1 to xn. We have to specify which variables can appear. Could be a variable. It could be k, the, the symbol k. Strictly speaking, the symbol k is a new formal system, of a new formal symbol. It's not an element of a. It's just a formal symbol a new formal symbol S, but I will write them later on as k and S. Or it's for a formal application. So it's uh, this is what an expression E is. It can be one expression applied to another expression. So now I would have to write formal dot, which is different from this dot. Okay, But I'm not going to do that later on. So these are just some expressions, expression trees, if you want to think of them that way. And now we can interpret them given such an expression and given a partial uh, a PPCA. Uh, so if we have uh, if we have a closed expression, what does it mean that it's closed? It means it doesn't contain any variables. If we have a closed expression and a parameter, I'm going to define the notation P at E, okay? Which means, this means, okay? So there are no variables, so I don't have to worry about that. So P at formal K is just the usual K. P at formal S is whatever S is from my uh, uh, PPCA, and formal application becomes formal application. So here, it may be undefined. This may be undefined because what I say is P E1 applies to P E2. So I just recursively sprinkle P everywhere. So because this application is partial, application at P, that means this may be undefined. 
Yes. Is there any quality guarantee for the S? Uh, this one, yes, thank you. This one is the Clean quality. For the S, we have the Clean quality. Yes. In fact, it's also the S. Okay. Um, what are some motivating examples? Examples. Well, let's have an example. Now, again, we can take oracles, but now we get to take a whole set of oracles. So, fix some subset of oracles, not empty, or let me make myself and Darwin happy, inhabited. Okay. <laughs> um, so, inhabited set of oracles, and then the underlying set is still the natural numbers, and then N applied to M at some oracle alpha is just phi alpha N M. So all I did was now I allow many oracles, you get to pick at what oracle you're, do you're doing this. If you have a parameterized, so every PCA, is also an example of a parameterized PCA because you just have a trivial parameter set. You have a parameter set which is a singleton and you define, you just ignore the parameter. It's a single parameter, it doesn't do anything. It's the number 42 and you get back the old notion of PCA. So this is a, this is a, a generalization. And we already argued that we can pull up the K and the S with the required properties. That we have them. Okay. Another example. Well, I told them that you fix like KNS for every alpha in the No, you have to pick a single KNS that works for all alphas. And there's something to be you need to think about this that you can actually do that. And that was why I was explaining late earlier that when you look for the K and S in this example, you notice that you can pick them in such a way that they don't depend on alpha. You just have to make sure that the Turing machines that are this is pure bureaucracy, right? This is so I get some number, then I get a number, another number, I ignore it, I return the first number. You don't need to, you don't need to consult oracles to do that. That's the point. But there will be other realizers, of course, other elements that do consult the oracles and then they do something. Another example, which kind of convinces me that this is a good definition, is Yadman Austin's. In his book, he has a construction which takes any partial combinatorial algebra A and any partial map from A to A, and then it constructs a new partial combinatorial algebra where this one, this, this uh, partial map, is adjoint, is added to A as an oracle. So it becomes representable in the new PCA. And this is a free construction. He does it in a way that is optimal so that any other algebra morphism that uh, allows us to interpret psi factors to this one. So it's, 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 it's just freely adjoining a new element uh, to a PCA. And his construction is parametric in psi which means that we can take any PCA, any set of partial maps from A to A, and we will get a parameterized PCA using the apps construction, which I think is very nice. Um, so this is the new and improved definition compared to what I had the other, the, the last time, this of course makes much, much more sense. And uh, um, the, the, actually the, the, reason why, the reason why this is this improvement came into existence is that James was unhappy with the old one and then he kept being unhappy with the old one and I said okay we have to try to make him happy and it, it just worked out. I have no idea why the, we use the complicated definition that we had the last time. So this Yarp's construction is just adding uh, another primitive operation? Uh, you need to, uh, you, no, you need to change the, uh, you, you use, you use the same elements uh, speaking from memory here, you use the same elements, but you change the application so that you really an application of one element to another, 
encodes a kind of dialogue between the PCA and this oracle. So it's kind of, it's like, it, it, you, you construct these lists which record how a dialogue between the PCA and the, and the oracle might have gone to, to get the result. It's, it's, it's a nice construction, but it's too complicated for me to recall it right now. But there's something, if you look at it, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Um, of course, you need to, you need to, you, something non-computable happens here, right? Because psi may not be, not be maybe non-computable. So what you're encoding, you're formally encoding these dialogues with an imagined um, um, oracle. Okay. So I was hoping to get in the first hour through also through the uh, combinatory completeness. So let me explain what the uh, relevance of PCAs is. Um, how do we work with them? Well, to motivate combinatory completeness, um, Oh, well, there are ways, there are categorical ways of motivating them, but maybe let's just do the programmatic one. Let's try to, uh, what is this now, combinatory completeness. Here it randomly says this is point number three. And now I'm not going to uh, replay combinatory completeness for ordinary PCAs and then for the parameterized one. I'm just going to go for the parameterized ones. So um, we're now going to work with expressions and we're first going to define abstraction. So assume, assume we're working in a, some fixed PPCA. Oh my God, I forgot expressions here. There's one other kind of expression which I forgot, apologies. For every element, For any element of my PCA, I can use it as a constant. Yes. So formally, I would have to again now use some other notation here, like uh, you know, constant a, like a formal symbol, which is indexed by uh, some particular element of a. And then here, of course, I would say p at this constant symbol a is just a. I can use in expressions. I can use element the elements of my PCA, but I'm going to write this just as A because too much formalism can hurt understanding. If you think that's not the case, you should try reading Clini's book, or Clini Vesley book. Okay. So uh, we want to we, we want to we want to be able to reasonably program with KNS. So uh, Let's define what abstraction is. Uh, this is an operation on, um, on expressions, and it's defined inductively as follows. So we're, we write it like this. I'll write it like this. So think of this. It's going to be similar to lambda xe, but it's not that, because we're not in lambda calculus. It's just a way of, of, of defining certain expressions. So uh, how does this go? Okay, so if we're abstracting over a variable y, then this is going to be k y. These are expressions. So y is a variable which is not equal to the variable x. If it's x, x, then intuitively speaking, we want this to be the identity map. How do you get the identity map from s and k? You write s, k, k, and then while you're waiting for your bus on the way home, you can calculate that s, k, k does the right thing. It's going to s, k, k applied to x is going to return x or an x. Okay. Uh, then if it's a constant, if it's a constant, then this is just k a, and if it's if we're abstracting over 
uh, if we're abstracting over a um, an application, we do this by S. We abstract E one. We abstract E two. So you could now try to calculate some of these things, like if you make some more complicated abstraction and it quickly gets out of hand and it becomes humongous and you can't understand anything because it's just a bunch of S as a case. So it's actually worse than trying to read assembler or web assembly. Um, okay, but uh, these abstractions have a very nice property called combinator. So we can use them to show that we can have a combinatory completeness. Before we get there, let me define a couple of notions here. Um, so if it, let's call that expression a closed expression E is called, is said to be uniform when E at E equals Q at E for all parameters P and Q. Parameters at P, okay? Um, so this is now what I'm so now defining what it means that I have an expression and it doesn't depend on the oracle. It doesn't depend on the parameter. Mind you, there can be constants in my PCA that will consult the oracle, right? And they may even appear inside of this E, but the result, the end result does not matter. It doesn't depend on what, what we will get. So this is going to be, because I wrote equal, this means in particular that I will get here a defined thing. So E is defined no matter what parameter we evaluate it at. And moreover, it's always the same element. So therefore, we can write, let me write it like this. Let this be the element that we get. This is going to be some element of A. And so let that be the element. This is the unique element such that P of E is E for all these. If you look at the definition of uh, the uh, PPCA, it's really saying, where is this? This part here, okay, is saying something about how things would be uniform, right? Now, do we have any such uniform thing, expressions? Yes. We have, for instance, this one, uh, a closed expression of the form, which is an abstraction. So if you have an expression, which is an abstraction, and there are no other free variables, there are no free variables here, is it's uniform. And this is not too difficult to see. Um, well, we got, let's have a look. It can't be this one because it's not closed. Okay. It could be this one, but so is SKK uniform? Yes, it is. By this condition here, SKK is uniform. And if it's this one, K of A, yes, it's uniform by this condition. And if it's that one, you use induction. Now you say, aha, by induction, this one is going to be uniform, and that one's going to be uniform. And then you have to think about the fact that S applied to uniform expressions give you, give you a uniform expression. Because when you, uh, when you, uh, yeah. OK. Uh, so this is good to know. If we write any closed expression, if there is an abstraction on the outside, we're really describing a fixed element of our PCA, of our underlying PPCA, and it doesn't depend on which parameter it is. It's a fixed thing. 
So let's also write down what combinatory completeness is. Am I forgetting anything? No. Sorry, but don't you require the T uniform? What is uniform? The E. No. 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 So E is any expression. It may have at most one free variable, which is X. And then when you calculate, and so this is going to be some other expression, and that one will be closed, no free variables. I claim it's uniform. So if you if you have an expression like this, if you, well, I mean, you, you can always have some constants in there, right? Uh, and the constants can mess things up because the constants may consult the parameter and then do weird things. But at least in this controlled way, this will never happen. Right? When they appear like this. Uh, yeah. Um, Combinatory completeness. Okay, let me do it right. Write it down and then explain the significance of this. Okay, so suppose again we have some fixed PPCA and we have an expression e in variables x1, careful, up to xn plus 1, so 1 too many, okay? There is some expression E star, uh, sorry, not an expression, there is an element of, there's an element of my PCA, which I will call E star, such that for all, Predicates for all parameters P, oops, wrong font, for all P and for all elements A1 up to, again, N plus 1, okay, we have, first of all, if I take this expression, so I applied my E. So this is a constant, right? And these are constants. So this is a bunch of constant applications. This is a, this is an expression. It's not an element of my PCA. I'm reading this as a formal expression. So there are here the formal. So this, this should really be C sub E, C sub A, and so on. This is uniform. Sorry, not, yeah, that's what I mean. And Uh, so this is now applying to everybody except the last a n plus one. You see, so I'm applying just to the. Uh, I, there's one more weighting to be applied. So if I apply just to the first n, it will it will be uniform. And um, now, if I actually apply it all the way, and then I look at what I got at some parameter at some parameter p, this is going to be clearly equal to saying, oh, it's the same thing as if you took the expression E and you substituted the A's for the X's. So A1 for X1 up to AN plus one is substituted for X and Just so follow up from E star, I want to A and the uniform, but all the, all the prefixes are also uniform. Ah, yes, that is a good question. Um, it will certainly follow from what I will take for E star. Uh, and um, that is a good point because I need to check whether I implicitly used it anywhere. Uh, but I think in all concrete cases, you know, in concrete cases, it was obvious because E star is an n, fold, n plus one fold abstraction. So that's why it's going to work. Okay. So it makes it to be part of the theorem. Yeah. I made it close. Okay, so the proof is that let me let me construct the E star carefully. Okay, um, so we define. Okay, so this is going to be a backward. I'll write it backwards because um, so 
Actually, I don't need to write this because I'm not going to prove the combinatorial algorithm because I'll just tell you what the E star is. So E star is uh, on the outside we need x1. So x1, x2, x n plus one, e. This one works. So, um, there's a bunch of lemmas, technical lemmas missing that would allow me to prove combinatorial completeness, but let's see what these lemmas would have to be, okay? So one such lemma, so missing lemmas, and you need to do this carefully, is you would certainly expect something like this to follow, to, to, to hold. If I have an expression E and I abstract it, and then I apply it to something, uh, so in our case, we just need to be able to apply it to some constant A, then I expect this, well, at some P. Okay, so let me write it the wrong way first. So it expect this to be the same thing as E, with A substituted for X. I want abstraction to actually work just the way abstraction usually works in a functional programming when I have a, that this is like a lambda abstraction. But this is, this is not good because these are expressions. So you need to think about how do you interpret them? So you would say at every parameter this happens and then probably you need something like this, okay? So you want to say, aha, yes, when I actually apply an abstraction to A, it's going to have the property that this is just like plugging A for X. It's just what I think it should be. So you prove a, you prove a lemma like this carefully, a couple of other lemmas, and then you see that, well, E star is this N plus one fold abstraction. So if I apply it to a bunch of, to N elements like that, when I use this, all these elements go inside, they get substituted, but there's one left over. I still haven't applied the N plus first one, so what I should get is something that should be like an abstraction still of this form. Yes. And then uh, that will uh, guarantee that I'm still uniform. Okay. So there's a bunch of, these are really kind of annoying technical lemmas that I think it's better not to go through. And anyhow, if you take the usual proof of combinatory completeness of ordinary PCAs, this is a fairly straightforward uh, generalization, the only thing to uh, uh, pay attention to is that you need to require uniformity instead of definiteness in certain places. That's all that needs to be done. And then it's okay. Okay, so this is how much I wanted to say. Oh, just okay. one more thing. Once we have this combinatory completeness, what this is now telling us is that PCAs are a lot like lambda calculus because this thing here behaves a lot like lambda xe, which I told you that it isn't. Well, but it is a lot like it, yes? So you can now use all the usual tricks of the lambda calculus to start programming. But in untyped lambda, the untyped lambda calculus is still incomplete. So you can encode numbers and pairs and recursion and fixed point operators and a bunch of things. It's an exercise in really strange kind of functional programming, which is also a lot of fun. We're not gonna do it here, we'll just, uh, we'll just uh, record for later that we can program things as necessary, including encoding numbers, for instance. Okay, so I think we should can have a short break now. Yeah. So everybody you know, get up, do some stretching. So let's come back once, uh, 20 past. Yes. No. You could have a uniform expression. Oh, closed. Um, no, I don't think so. Because you could have a, uh, you can, so if you just take a constant A by itself, that's a closed expression. So consider the, uh, consider uh, uh, in our motivating example, consider the machine that uh, looks at the third 
the third uh, term of the oracle and returns the value. Just inspect, like, go, go to the oracle page, see what's written, that's my output. Yes, so I'm answering your question. Oh, uh, what? Oh, oh, sorry, of oh, this form, yeah. Um, Are you so you no sorry you're asking are there closed expressions which are uniform but are not like that oh yes yes sure yes um okay uh, yes you can't get k this way okay you'll get something that behaves like k because you can write down this x y x okay this behaves like k it's got the same, it's going to do the same thing, but it's guaranteed to be uniform. So, because what is this? Well, this is kx. So, this here is s k x x. So, this is s kx. This is this one kk. This one is s kk. So this is that. Mm -hmm. It works just like K, but it's... it's well, is it's, there like a complete description of how they perform the No, I think that would probably depend a lot on the particular PCA that you have. Yeah. Because there can be some elements of A which do strange things, and maybe they are not there, maybe they're there, who knows? I mean, even all constants are... Uh, no, I don't think how... Why, or why would we constants uniform? So a constant need not be uniform. Because, no, no, only because the non-uniformity comes in only when you do application. So a constant need not be uniform, but for every constant, this is uniform. So what is this? Well, again, this is S, K, A, S, K, K. This thing works just like A. Okay? So when I apply it, it will, it will have the same effect as A, but it is uniform. Yeah, but the interpretation of the constant at P is just A, so that's uniform, right? Uh, where are we? Uh, also, the constant itself is uniform. Yes, 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 yes thank you. Yes, yes, constant. But once you start applying, yeah, yeah, thank you, yes, yes. Uh, yes, so, right. So, just like A applied, to be as an expression, of course, need not needs not be uniform. Yeah. Yes, constants are still also uniform. I'm not saying these are only uniform ones. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, this is confusing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that in that case, what would your PCA be your, your sort of uniform PCA or whatever you call it? Wasn't it formed out of these expressions? Um, the expressions and the PCA were kind of folded into the one thing, and then I then we identified this A subplot of those elements of the PCA which are like uniform expressions. Right. Yeah, and then we worked with those. And in order to build the PCA, you have to construct about the expressions. Uh, oh, uh, last time. If we, this, yeah, it's kind of nice anyway. yeah, so last time, the theorem that says every PCA begets an ordinal, every PCA begets a sort of a trivial PPCA with a single parameter, that was complicated yeah. because I couldn't just reuse the, uh, the, the PCA. I had to do some magic with expressions to make sure that they were in the A sub dot. This is nicer. The only thing that seems slightly to be improved here yes. is, that, is that the, the word uniformity has gone out of the, the, the name of the because sort of uniformity is kind of really intrinsic. Yes. Here, but, but you've changed from uniformity. Yes. To uh, so this is now the uniformity teams. At, at first, uniformly parameterized or something. That's something that's different. Well, at first, uh, we had parameterized. Then when I gave the Topos Institute talk, somebody convinced me that it should be called uniform. And then after some more thinking, I decided that that is the wrong thing to say, that it's better to say parameterize. There is what here says that there is anything uniform. 
about the parameter set. Because there's something uniform, which is the K and S. So that's the, that's the yeah. So, that's the, right. So it's about K and S being sort of fixed enough, right? It's not about uniformity in the set P per se, I think. Other than, well, I mean, yeah, it's, it propagates. One, the, once the K and the S have this property, there will be lots of things having this property that they're kind of nicely uniform. But, you know, you might as well just say they're constant because it doesn't, they ignore P and Q. It, it would be, I think, equally correct to call them, to say they're constant. Anyway, I, I, I will resist switching for the third time. Yeah, you seem to have a strong limitation. Well, it's a very strong concept, which is dependent upon the solution. Anyway, it doesn't yeah. So, Egbert and Katya are our test cases. And who's, who's, back, who's back there? Mm -hmm. oh, yes, they took it seriously when we said 20 past. I think I'm slightly out of scope, right? Right now, this here, is this readable? Uh, this is readable, but the other one isn't. No. Or yeah, there. Problem, okay, so I just shouldn't. So where should I? Let me put a borderline here. Just turn on the light. Hmm? The lights are on. All the lights are on. Really? Yeah. Are they? Yeah. So but I can uh, I can say don't go beyond this, for instance. Nope, not good enough. I should not go beyond approximately here. I think you should just move the view. I'm cutting off too much here because here we can see the wall. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, but I'm, I'm, oh you're moving. I'm not ah, okay. excellent. Okay. okay. So, but you'd like me to not go beyond like what? Here ish? Oh, I can use everything. Uh, I can try. No, I mean, it's too dark. Yeah, it's a bit remote. I'll try not to go beyond that line. Okay. Okay. Part two. Part two is, once you have a model of computation, how do you make a nice topos out of it? And the answer is, you first make a tripos out of it. And once you have a tripos, whatever that is, then you make a topos. This is Andy Pitts PhD. This is Andy Pitts PhD. Um, okay, so. Let's look at that. And I'm going to say a few words about what the point is of all this tripos to topos business. Um, so I'll first look at triposes. You start from the idea that we're going to model logic into tunistic logic in some way. Well, if we're going to model intuitionistic logic, then the truth values should form a heighting algebra. Because, well, classical logic gives you a Boolean algebra, and uh, intuitionistic logic gives you a heighting algebra. Okay, so what is a heighting algebra? It's like a Boolean algebra, but less. We'll, we'll get to it. This is not really precise enough. It's precise enough to speak about intuitionistic 
propositional calculus, that is to say, where all we have are some atomic propositions and we want to use the uh, connectives on them and or implication, negation, truth, falsehood. A more general kind of logic is predicate calculus. When we have predicate calculus, you need to explain what the predicates are. So the predicates are always the predicates on a set, such as prime primality is a prime number. That's a predicate on the set of natural numbers. So in the next step, we say, okay, we're gonna have sets and we'll have predicates on them, but these are not going to be classical predicates. Classical predicates would be just subsets of X. That would give us the usual classical logic. So we wanna say something else. To each set, for each set, there will be some set of predicates on it, all the possible predicates on such a set. So what a tripos is, it's essentially some sort of a mapping. Ah, disclaimer. I am not going to describe the most general possible construction of triposes, just the particular one that I need. I will comment a little bit on where the generalization comes up. But the first idea is that to each set, we want to assign predicates on that set. Well, but the predicates on a set, because this is going to be intuitionistic logic, should form a heighting algebra. Without much damage, we can say heighting pre-algebra. So here, I'm going to have heighting, heighting pre-algebras. What is the difference between algebra and pre-algebra? A pre-algebra just means that equivalent, state, equivalent uh, predicates need not be equal. But if you collapse them, if you're quoting them by, by, by equivalence, you will just get an honest algebra. So an algebra is a partial order, whereas pre-algebra is a pre-order. You don't have anti-symmetry. It doesn't matter. Okay? It's usually, I find it easier to work with heighting pre-algebras. This is not an important matter. Okay, so these would be the heighting pre-algebras, whatever they are. They are the things that model intuitionistic connectives. And to each set, we will assign what we think of as these special intuitionistic predicates uh, on, on the set. So set X here, you have red X. You think of this as predicates on X. Question? Is predicate supposed to be small? Uh, we, yes, so yes, I am not in pipe theory. I will not concern myself with smallness and greatness and stuff like that, okay? I'll explain the ideas and I'm sure you can work them out easily enough. Now, if you ask the more formal question of can you pull off the tripos to topos construction in a predicative setting, yeah. I don't know. I would look at the end and he's going to give you the, the, the answer or something. Yeah. Yeah. See, he knows something. Talk to him. Okay. Now, of course, just having a map like that, that's not how we want to do things. We really want a functor here. So we want this to be a functor between categories. It turns out you want a contravariant functor. So uh, to each predicate, to each set, we give some predicates. Why do we want the contravariant functor? Because when you have a map like that, that should give you a map in the other direction for a very simple reason. Suppose I have a predicate f on x, okay? Suppose I have a map F or a map R from Y to X. Then if I have a Y in I, I can write down phi of R of Y, right? So phi takes elements from X. It's a predicate on X. So R of Y is an element of X. So here I will have another predicate. So this predicate, I could write it like this, R star phi of Y. So, the functorial action 
of this business here is this pulling back of predicates along maps. Okay, so I want I want a functor here. There are other conditions. I'm not done yet. It's not just a contravariant functor. That's it. There will be other conditions uh, for something to be called a tripos. But anyhow, before I tell you list all the conditions, which is not really um, necessary at this point, let's define the concrete tripos that we want to have, because we were going to have a concrete one. This is a very general theory, but we will use a concrete one. And of course, for the rest, we just fix some PPCA. So it's a PCA together with a parameter set and some application. And now we define a tripos. Okay. So uh, I need to tell you what predx is. But before I tell you what predx is, I need, I need some I need another piece of notation that will make these things easier, which is gonna we already had that the first time around. So define. Okay. So well, it's kind of the notation comes in together with the definition. So pred on X, this needs to be some heighting pre-algebra. So the heighting pre-algebra that we're going to take now is just the power set of A X with some, because it's a pre-algebra, it should have some pre-order. With a pre-order, this pre-order, I'm going to define it. But let us first think about how, let us first, so I will define this pre-order and there is a trick hiding in the pre-order. But before we do that, let's think about what this is, okay? So in the usual case, it would be, like purple, and say Mr. Oh uh, yes, it is, sorry. In the paper, it's. So the usual one would be that this is two to the X, right? or that it's the power set of X. But notice that the power set of X is the power set of one to the X. So it's two to the X, right? So a predicate, what will be a predicate? A predicate is going to take an element of X and it will return a set of, I'll call the elements of A realizers from now on, okay? So it takes an element and gives you a set of realizers. And the way you think about this is the bigger the set, the truer the, pro the, the truth value. So the empty set is going to mean false. The entire A means entirely, completely, trivially true. And there will be in between levels where you have some set of realizers witnessing the fact that something holds. Okay, so we need to define the pre-order. And if you know the eligibility, there are not going to be any surprises here. Uh, it's clear what we're going to do. We're going to stick in the parameters in the in some place. We need to stick in the parameter so that things work out. Okay, so let's um, define this for a closed expression e uh, over this PCA, and um, if we have. Um, P a parameter, and then we have a phi in red x, and we have x in x. Define the following E realizes at P phi of x. This means, by definition, okay, that P at E is defined and P E is an element of five X. This is now just notation so far. So let's look at it. We will very often want to write the fact that some element of my PCA, so the elements of the PCAs, you think of they realize five X. Okay, so and very often we will have this condition that we say we have an expression, it's defined at P, and when you compute it at P, you get an element of 5x. And so this is just the shorthand. And now the condition is now I, I now need to write this. 
So if I have phi and psi, which are two predicates on X, then what does it mean that phi entails psi? It means that there is an element of my underlying A such that for all X in X, for all B in B, uh, for all B in phi of X, for all parameters P, A applied to B realizes at P psi of X. If the parameter set is just a singleton so that we have the ordinary PCA, then you get the ordinary definition of entailment because the ordinary definition of entailment says you can, phi entails psi means there is a program, namely A, or there's a realizer A, that converts realizers of phi of x to realizers of psi of x, x uniformly in x. So a couple of points to be made here. You need a single realizer that is going to do something. And the thing that it's going to do is it will convert realizers of phi to realizers of psi. That's how we think of, well, that's actually kind of like implication, right? In the BHK interpretation. Two caveats, it needs to work for all x's, even though it doesn't get any information about x here. So. A just gets a B without being told what the little x was. And uh, so it particularly cannot depend on the little x. And it has to work for all parameters. That's entailment. OK. You get a tripos after this. Because we're done defining, oh, no, I have to define the factorial function, the factorial uh, this one here, but it's just the obvious one. So defined. So if I have F from, I'm sorry, if I have R from Y to X, then I need to define R star, which goes the other way around from predicates on X to predicates on Y, but it's just precomposition. So I have here a phi. And this phi will go from x to the power set of a. And what I need is a y to power set of a. Well, that's easy. It's phi composed with r. Because r starts in y, gets it to x, then phi works. And it's exactly this. It's just this. Okay. Because this here is phi composed with r applied to y. So R star of Y is this. This gives us a tripos, which means, what does that mean? Okay, so now let's say, what, what do we have to verify? Let's just think about what we need to check, okay? So we're claiming that the spread of X is a heighting algebra, free algebra. Well, I defined a relation. So to check, what do we need to check? So first of all, we need to check that thread X is a heighting free algebra. Well, what does this mean? This means that the order needs to be reflexive and transitive. Egbert, move the camera. Egbert, ah, thanks. Well, Let's do reflexivity in our heads. Which A do you think might work? It has to be something that converts realizers of phi to realizers of phi. Well, it needs to be the more or less the identity function, but you have to say it as an element of as an element of uh, of my PCA. So it's abstraction x x or s k k. Transitivity exercise. You just have to figure out how to compose things using lambda calculus, which is not too difficult. Then, once we have a free order, 
what else do we need? Well, what does it mean to have a hiking algebra? What does it mean to have a hiking algebra? It means that as a category, it's by Cartesian closed. So we need the least element, the top element, conjunction, disjunction, and implication. We need to verify that Prem of X really has all these operations on it, that you can define them in such a way that they work. What does it mean that they work? This one has to be the least element. This one has to be the greatest element. It's here it needs to calculate the infimum of two predicates with respect to this order. This one here needs to calculate the supremum of two elements. And this one here must be right adjoint to conjunction. And then you have the right thing and you can verify these things. Um, so let's do just to make so we get used to this. Let's just write down a couple of them. So what is this? Well, to be actually to be quite exact, you would need to subscript them with this. So this is a map which takes a little x from x and it gives you a set which is the meaning of m. So you, you put in empty. And then you go here and you look and you say, aha, if this is empty, I'm done. Because this universal quantifier, so pick some a, doesn't matter which one, and then you're done when you get to the empty set here. And then this one, you say everything. And then why is this the largest one? So if psi is this top business, why will this hold? Well, all you need to make sure is that A, a applied to B is defined at P. So you take for A anything, like K, K of B will be always defined, and then it will end in A. Um, here, this, you encode pairs. So you take a realizer from phi, a realizer from psi, then you encode a pair using your TCA. This needs to encode uh, disjoint sums. Yes, so uh, you need to take either an element of from here or there, but also a piece of information telling you which disjoint you came from. And this is uh, more or less represented functions which can be represented by elements of A. We're not. Yeah, right, it's not arbitrary joints. Because I am so far, uh, what? You're, you're saying that it's by inside to be this joint. No, 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 no. The realizer, okay, so let's do this one. What do the realizer for phi of psi look like? Phi or psi at x is going to be those a's in a such that for all parameters p, the first projection of a at p realizes phi of x. And no, the first projection at A, P at first, P of first A. So first is a particular element that you use. Yeah. And then you calculate what this is. And you want this to be the constant true, which is a certain uniform constant. And if this happens, then you expect the second of A to realize phi of x. So that's one possibility. The other one is, or you look at the first component of A, and if you see false, well, then you also want the second of A to realize psi. So this is the definition. Okay. So what this is saying is that a proof, if you think proof theoretically, which is uh, uh, a good enough analogy, right? It's saying, aha, an element, of, an element A like this, think of it as a pair. It's going to be like a pair, B, C. And this B is going to be either true or false. If B is true, then, the set, then C has to realize phi. And if B is false, then C has to realize the form. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. We're just trying to write down what needs to be checked without checking it, but at least to know what needs to be checked. So far, what we're going to get this way is going to, we're going to get intuitionistic propositional calculus on every particular X, we have propositional connectives. If you want to have quantifiers, we have to verify that we have quantifiers. How do you verify that you have quantifiers? Well, we learned from Lavier, Lavier has to be Lavier, right? That exists and for all are the uh, left and the right adjoints to this R star business here. So you know that you need to look for certain adjoints. And then you also have to check some technical conditions, uh, uh, you know, that they are sufficiently nice and the back Chevrolet condition. But to give you some intuition, pick one. I could give you the easier one or the more complicated one. Which one? Oh, the easy one. The easy one? Okay. The easy one is the existential. Because the uh, the universal one can be tricky when the indexing is not subjective. There is a little trick there. So it's good that we're not going to get into that trick. You can ask me later. Uh, where is it? OK, so how does this work? So suppose you have a map R from Y to X. Then you're going to get a map in the other direction which is R star, red Y. So now we are going to define a map called exists sub R, which goes this way, okay? Which takes predicates to predicates. It has to be left adjoint to R star. Um, and then once you're done doing this, this is more general than what you actually need, then the ordinary that exists an X in X such that phi of X, Y, this one arises as a special case of this one, where you take the first projection, second, uh, second projection, the way I'm writing it, applies to phi. You think uh, we can have a seminar on categorical logic where we explain these things. So um, right now I'm concerned with how do I how do I write down the existential? So here the existential. Ready to go? Okay. So I have a phi here. I have a phi here, and now this becomes R. Oops. This becomes exists R phi. So what is exists R phi? Exists R phi is something that takes an element of X, and now it has to give me a set of realizers. Which ones? Well, no surprise here. Egbert really did pick the wrong one because it's super easy because it's the same as the usual one. Why are you adding both the first just for or because it's required for the tripos? It's required for the tripos. Okay. Uh, yes. And there is one other thing that's required for the tripos, which is called a generic object, okay. uh, which I'm not going to explain right now. But I can tell you what the plan is. So we defined, you can ask me later what the universal quantifier is doing, but it's the ordinary definition of the universal quantifier in PCA is except to stick in the parameter as well and say it has to work for all parameters. This looks like a good attempt at, so maybe I can uh, explain the motivation here. This looks like a good attempt at defining a kind of nice intuitionistic set theory or intuitionistic logic or something where I'm just going to use good old sets as my types and then I will use these predicates as my predicates, and I can hope to get uh, maybe you know a model of uh, set theory with intuitionistic logic or something like that. But that doesn't actually happen, or if it does, it happens in a kind of a really strange way. 
And the reason that it's strange is here. When I defined uh, entailment between my intuitionistic predicates, I required that I have a single program that works for all little x's, but the single program doesn't get any information about the x's, which means that as far as this logic is concerned, the underlying elements are totally invisible. You can never say anything about them. They are completely ignored. It's also about tickets. It can depend, well, what A you pick, of course, depends on phi and, uh, which phi and psi you're trying to entail, right? Right, right. But it's, it's, it's not, you can't do anything about this. So, for instance, if you want to say something like, for every natural number that is a prime larger than it, you are not going to be told which natural number. And so it's going to be hard to calculate the prime that you're supposed to find because you don't know which natural number. So what is missing here is information about the elements of the underlying sets. So the tripos is in a sense only the first step towards the construction that we really want. The construction that we really want should also use this very nice idea that things are realized by programs at the level of sets, which so far we haven't done. That's what we need to fix. And that is the next step, and it's called the tripos to topos construction. Whenever you have a tripos, there's a way of generating this improved version where you have also reasonable objects that also know something. Okay. And the way one way of thinking about this is as follows. Well, did I really define first order logic here? Yeah, well, I have all the connectives and I'm going to have for all that exists, but I don't have equality. Usually when you have logic, at some point you want to start talking about equality, I don't have it. How should we define equality? Well, what would equality be? Well, I would want equality to be a map like that, right? Equality on X. Takes two X's, tells me to what extent they're equal. But since realizers don't get any information about the elements, this is going to be kind of hard to do in a reasonable way because I have two elements, I know nothing about them, and now I have to calculate or witness computationally the fact that they're equal. That's not going to work. So this is the bit that's missing. We need to do something about these equalities. Well, what could we do? How about we just add them? Right? We just say, ah, we've got the wrong objects. We're going to use sets, but each set should be equipped with something that tells us how we witness equality using realizers. And that's precisely what's missing. So that's what we do. So you get to get to the topos. Where should I get to the topos? Now, here. I want to keep that picture there. So you're not adding realizers elements of the set of realizers. Yes. And once I know how the uh, com comparisons are realized, I will derive from that the realizers for elements. And that's the tripos. No, the tripos to topos is this whole idea that in the next step, I fix my sets by equipping them with an equality predicate. That's called the tripos to topos. Uh, on the way, as one of the auxiliary definitions that we get is this idea of, oh, but how do we say that a realizer realizes an element? Now, again, this construction works for a very general, uh, for any tripos, but I'm going to write down what we get just for this our particular kind of tripos. So, presumably that's five. The topos. So this is the topos, which I would write like this. Parametralizability topos will be given A and P. And what is an object? An object is a pair x equal x, where x is a set 
And this equal is precisely what I want. A map from x cross x to the power set of A, which by the way, just says that this is an element of red x x, x cross x. <laughs> okay? We're not done yet. Should we require any properties of this map? Well, the obvious ones you would want to require are reflexivity, symmetry, and the transitivity. Okay? We're going to drop reflexivity. There are deep reasons why I want to do that, but we're going to drop reflex. No, they're not deep reasons. Does it matter? I think it matters. Wait. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, exercise, check books to see if it matters. Such that, okay. And now I want to say that this is a reflexive and transitive relation. But how am I going to say that? This is not an ordinary relation, so I can't just use my ordinary logic. I have to use the Tripos logic. That's why I needed the first step. I gave myself enough realizability logic to be able to say now that this needs to be symmetric and transitive. And we're going to discuss why reflexivity is not there in a, in a moment. And the way you say that is you want to say that this statement, let me write down to see symmetry. So symmetry would be for all x and y in x. If I have this relation like that, it implies this. But what is this? Well, using my tripos business, I can see that this is going to be a certain this using the connectives that I just defined here. Yeah, this will end up being a certain element of the power set of A because it's a truth value. It's closed. It's a closed statement, so a truth value. Formally, maybe it's power set of A to the power of one, but I'm not going to go there. So this is going to be a certain set of realizers. And I want to say that this is true. Well, how do I say that this is true? I say that this is true by saying that this predicate here, this truth value here, is, well, this is the, I'm over the unit set because I'm in the closed context. I want to say it's the top truth value. It's the largest one. That's how you say that something is true. To say it's above truth. Well, then, then of course, it's going to be equivalent to truth because the other inequality is automatic. Okay, but can we say this with a little more concretely? Yes, we can say this a little more concretely. And the, the way we're going to say this is we're going to define what it means for a predicate to be valid. Okay, so validity. So I want to say So I explain this and then I think we're gonna be we're gonna be done. If I have some predicate phi on X, then I'm going to write do I want to use here? Well, presumably the one that I have all over the place. So I want to write it like this. I want to write when x ranges over this set x. And now I'm going to use this notation. This means that it means that phi is the top predicate. But concretely, this happens if and only if what? Well, now you can calculate. What does it mean for this set to be inhabited? Okay, so what that, well, no, so, sorry, what does it mean for this to hold? Well, you go here, you look, you plug in the true, well, you plug in true for this one, this one is phi, you compute, it says there is a certain A, okay? If there is an A in A, which witnesses the fact that so when you apply it to anything, you will get something in phi, but then you can optimize this. It could use a different day that you don't have to apply. 
like that. So if there exists an A such that for all P in P, A at P in, uh, for all A in A, for all X, I forgot the X. So if there exists a single A such that for all X in X, for all parameters P, A at P implies prior X. So this is what it means to be valid, to be true, to be about truth. It means you have a single realizer, which is going to be always in 5x without knowing which x is. So now we know how to say this. We just say it is valid that. So now I don't have to fiddle with these quantifiers. I can just instead say, ah, if I have x in x and I have y in y, there, then it is valid that uh, x equal y implies y equal x. And then similarly for transitivity, we're going to have x and y and z, and we'll do the usual thing. These are the conditions that say that it's reflexive and transitive, uh, symmetric and transitive. What happens to reflexivity? Well, it's not there. So let us define the so-called existence predicate. E sub x of x, let this be just the realizers showing that x equals x. Now, if I required reflexivity, then this would always be non empty. But the way you can think about it is as follows it may happen that this function, my equality, say, says x equals x, not empty set. The way to think of this is as saying, uh, is, is saying this is saying to what, to what amount does x exist computationally? So, in principle, you can have a funny object which has some elements, but from the computational point of view, they don't exist. You can't represent them with any realizer. The way that logic works out is that it takes care of this. For any element that you can't even represent with any realizer, because it's just not there, it turns out you can just ignore them. Like when you're checking conditions, the, the relevant conditions are always vacuous because they say for every realizer of X, but there, isn't, there aren't any, so you can just drop them. And when you have assemblies, right, you start with this one. You give this one. Okay, so I think we're going to finish here. We can maybe continue some other day to explore the topos further. We didn't explain what the morphisms of the topos are, but I can say one general thing. How do you define functions in set theory? Because in set theory, you only have sets, but then somehow you create functions. What are they? The functional relations, right? So here we use the same trick. We just have so far sets with funny equality predicates on them. And we're going to take as morphisms functional relations. How do you say functional relations? Using the tripos logic. And there are certain technical aspects to it where you have to worry that the relation doesn't relate things that don't exist and so on, but functional relations. Uh, so that gives you morphisms, and then you can show that you have a topos. Why is it a topos? Because the tripos needs to have a generic object, and you can use that one to give. Uh, the sub-object classifier. So in the next installment, I would, what would I do in the next installment? I would look at this topos and uh, calculate a couple of things so that you would see, for example, that choice fails, at least, uh, well, in non-legal cases. Uh, and uh, maybe we can take a closer look at the reals and things like that to see that the Cauchy reals and the dedicated reals are different and we have explicit the descriptions of both, and they make sense to me, at least I think they're natural and so on. I think there is a lot of scope for playing with the parameterized PCAs here. 
um, by, by, by fiddling with the set P and the A. And you can bring in, and James does, uh, bring in uh, uh, all sorts of computability, computability theoretic results by taking the first linear algebra and you carefully pick a set of realizers and then something weird happens because computability theory. Um, so one of the things that happens is that the Dedekind reals can be countable, but I'm sure that other weird things can happen. So I'm going to finish here. Uh, sorry for the overtime. Thanks. Uh, uh, Andrew, uh, I suggest Andrew gave the seminar about cubical realizability and answers the question. How does that sound good to you? Because that sounds great to me. I would like to know more about cubical, uh, cubical sets, uh, cubical, uh, what is it? Yeah, uh, cubical assemblies in particular, right, is what you construct. Uh, but my understanding is that no, that's not going to be the identity type. This one is uh, this this kind of equality inside the topos is extensional. Yeah, so yeah. I'm asking that this is the step where the set you're going to do something. Yeah, yeah. You, you, this, this, the, uh, from what I understand, and I don't understand much, the, to get to the cubical stuff, there's a third step. You work inside this topos to do more. So you play inside the topos or inside the endings. Yeah. It's uh, the object classifier is the power set of is the power set of A, and as a quality you use uh, tripos by implication, so equivalence tripos equivalent logical equivalence, and you get the uh, sub object classifier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. The last question. Where is lunch? Um, does anybody have a preference? Because I don't have a strong preference. Pizza or burgers? Pizza or burgers? You're the one that's required. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's exactly the point of asking the speaker, right? So that's, well, uh, oh, let's go for pizza. So meet downstairs. Anybody would like to go for pizza? Thanks. Uh,